Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, both here in Minneapolis and also uh, by web on our webinar format. Uh, today we're going to be talking about reducing risk in the Internet of Things. I'm Chip Maggie. I'm uh, a co-chair of Dorsey's Product Liability Practice Group, and I am very privileged to have as my co-presenter today Mike Rossman of Accenture. Uh, Mike is Managing Director at Accenture's Global Cybersecurity Strategy Practice, uh, both uh, inside industry and as a consultant. He has worked with a variety of uh, Fortune 500 companies, uh, as well as uh, the U.S. Intelligence uh, Services and the Department of Defense. Uh, he focuses uh, in uh, cybersecurity risk management and systems development and operations uh, with a particular focus on energy, the uh, energy utility, technology, manufacturing, and financial services sectors. Uh, so welcome, Mike, to uh, Dorsey and Whitney, and thanks for presenting today. Thank you. Um, the, the Internet of Things is a somewhat awkward uh, title, uh, but what we're talking about, and that is the common lexicon, are the millions and, in fact, billions of devices that are all connected to each other uh, through the internet. Uh, there are approximately 6.4 billion devices, that's billion with a B, devices this year uh, that are connected uh, to each other in some way. Uh, that's expected to grow to 20.8 billion by 2020. Uh, and if you do the math, and I can't do it in my head, so I had to read this, but that means 5.5 million new devices are being added every day. So that's a lot of devices. Uh, and, and what does that mean? Uh, Mike, you want to talk about uh, exactly what the Internet of Things is? Okay. Um, the Internet of Things applies both at an industrial level to businesses and also to products and things which enter your home life, your personal life as well. Um, everything from uh, public sector, uh, there's actually in the design process in several places across the globe, the smart city much like you might have seen in a movie, um, the management of security systems, traffic control, and lighting control from a central point. Um, in automotive, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about some of the impacts that have been seen there, um, the application of connectivity and, um, uh, and being able to interact more, uh, more personally with the driver and, uh, and those in the car, including uh, for safety uh, and also for entertainment services and for efficiency. In manufacturing, there's been an explosion of the Internet of Things by applying smarts up at the factory assembly line and at the manufacturing lines through control systems. Uh, and again, we'll talk a bit about where we've actually witnessed um, intrusions, exploits, and uh, devastating attacks in those areas that have already been seen. In healthcare, the concern about um, you know, what happens when you have remote monitoring of patients and systems in a hospital or whether it's remote control of medical devices and wearables that are on individuals as they go about their daily life. Um, and also the exchange of personal information that comes uh, streaming from those devices uh, to back-end systems which accumulate huge stores of data about individual aid about uh, individuals. Um, imagine in aviation with remote access to an engine, uh, if not during flight, uh, prior to flight being able to inject um, into a control module, a piece of malware that would cause the engine to malfunction mid-flight uh, because now it's interconnected to a maintenance uh, organization and a maintenance facility. In utilities, and you may have seen more of this on, over the air and uh, in the news, uh, and also um, there, there have been um, in front of Congress a number of hearings, is the application of technology all the way up into your home, your smart meter, uh, and taking it all the way back uh, through the grid to power generation and the switching and control of power around the country. And we'll talk a bit about some, uh, some things that have been witnessed there in terms of exploitations and uh, impacts uh, to power generation, power distribution. The Good. smart, I'm sorry. Go ahead. The smart home, um, it, we're, we're now building appliances, and some of you may have seen it, going to your Best Buy, your, your refrigerator is connected to the Wi-Fi network. Um, and uh, you know, entertainment systems now on the same Wi-Fi network. And we'll talk about the fact that a number of other critical pieces of computer gear, smartphones, are also on the same Wi-Fi network, interconnected, computerized, able to be attacked. So you uh, touched, Mike, on a couple of vulnerabilities 
Uh, shall we start with the industrial sector? Okay. Um, Do you want me to play the video? Yes. You want to tell everyone what it is before they get to see it? Or, okay. or, or while we're playing it? Here we go. So what we're looking at now is a test that was done several years ago to demonstrate the ability of translating an attack in cyberspace to an attack in physical space. And this was staged at the Idaho National Labs in um, uh, the, the Department of Energy runs. And what that is uh, is an excerpt from the destruction of a fairly large size generator, the type that would power like a large hospital campus, even a small s suburb. And um, by sending a series of control commands um, from a com you know, through its network computer connection, they were able to um, cause the internal destruction of the power generator. And, and then uh, we recently had an event in the news with uh, Ukraine's power grid being uh, brought down. Okay. Um, and I, I'm going to touch on this a bit more later, but not, not that long ago in December, um, as part of the political interactions between us and, uh, and uh, another Eastern, uh, uh, Eastern European nation, uh, the uh, Ukrainian power grid, um, a, a large portion of several provinces, uh, was taken out of, uh, uh, it was taken offline, 60 substations um, disabled, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in depth in a moment. All right. Uh, this is an excerpt from uh, testimony that was given by the Director of National Intelligence last month uh, before uh, the Senate, uh, and these, this, of course, is the, the published version of it, and this is taken right from the published remarks, and you can see uh, that one of the top security threats identified by uh, the Director of National Intelligence uh, is the Internet of Things and smart devices. And if you look at the second, uh, second sentence, he says the uh, security industry analysts have demonstrated that many of these new systems can threaten data privacy, data integrity, or continuity of services. And continuity of services is a euphemism for shutting down the power grid, shutting down a water utility, shutting down uh, a hospital uh, system, shutting down a plant, uh, uh, shutting down the banking system, uh, all threats that, that uh, have, have uh, been brought to light by the intelligence community. Um, you may recognize this gentleman, uh, uh, former Vice President Dick Cheney, and, and why do we have uh, Dick Cheney here? Um, as many of you know, uh, the former Vice President suffers from uh, heart ailments, uh, and had a pacemaker installed in 2007. And as part of that, uh, after a risk assessment, uh, all of the uh, interconnected features that would read the pacemaker and, and uh, read data from the pacemaker were, were disabled uh, because of the threat that uh, terrorists could send a communication to the pacemaker uh, and uh, uh, cause his, his heart to fail. Uh, it, it sounds like science fiction, uh, but it turns out that there, this is a, a real-life concern. Uh, you're, you're now looking at a um, hospital infusion pump. This is a particular pump that, that was manufactured by Hespera, uh, and uh, it's, it's uh, no longer sold. But uh, independent security researchers in the Food and Drug Administration did some tests and demonstrated that this uh, particular model had a number of uh, cyber vulner vulnerabilities that would allow someone to take control of it change the dosages. Um, uh, obviously, if, if you're infusing a, a, a patient with medicine that's needed, uh, that could have uh, severe consequences. The same researchers in the FDA also determined that it could be used in a different way because it was connected, and this device was designed to be connected either through the wire or wirelessly to the hospital's um, information system. You know, information about patient needs, dosages, what kind of medication was needed and when uh, is all interconnected. And, and the same vulnerability that would allow someone to go in and do damage to an individual patient could also be used in reverse to become kind of the root of a botnet and uh, take over the, the hospital systems. Uh, and as a consequence, uh, the Food and Drug Administration first issued a specific alert uh, uh, with regard to that device and advising hospitals and care facilities to discontinue using it if possible, and then came out with a uh, with some guidance uh, that for both manufacturers and the medical community, uh, this was the middle of last year, talking about the potential vulnerabilities. Okay. And just to, to inject a bit of um, what reality might be for this. Inject, that's a good term when we're talking about an infusion pump. In an era where, um, for example, we're seeing uh, ransomware, 
and, and for those of you who don't know, ransomware is an attack. Someone gets inside of your enterprise network and it encrypts your systems, your data, so you no longer can use any of the uh, information assets, any of the technology. And ransomware has been detected um, not only on offshore platforms recently and different kinds of industrial sites, but ransomware was also directed at hospitals. Now, I think that would be far more effective uh, and, you know, to, to try and attack where you threaten uh, to uh, damage or take offline or cause harm to patients with an attack uh, and extort money that way as opposed to ransomware because you might have, for example, backups of your system. Um, there, well, yeah, that said, though, uh, wasn't it Hollywood Hospital that paid $17,000 in Bitcoin to uh, right. unlock its own systems? Right. And then both of us are from the, uh, the D.C. area, and a large hospital system there, MedStar, has been offline this week. I don't know if they're back up yet. Uh, uh, and, and as far as I know, it wasn't ransomware, but just showing how prevalent these interconnected devices are, uh, they, the hospital had to turn off all of its devices, uh, and so nurses are running around with manual charts, in many cases for the younger nurses, something they aren't even familiar with, uh, trying to figure out dosages and, and patient instructions, so they canceled all non-essential surgery, uh, uh, been turning away people from the hospital. Right. Uh, you know, although our focus here is uh, less the, the data breach aspect and more on the operational aspect, this demonstrates just how uh, right. insecure some of these systems are. That's true. Uh, so then in the home, uh, this is an ad from Samsung for its smart TV system. Uh, and I don't know if your eyes are better than mine. You might see that in the ad it talks about uh, when you wake up, you can get the time, the local weather, and your personal schedule on the screen, which is, you know, a terrific thing if you don't know what your personal schedule is, I guess. You turn on your TV and, and, and figure it out. Uh, the, the problem, there are a couple of issues with this. First of all, um, and, and not to, to pick on Samsung in particular, but with a lot of these smart TVs, vulnerabilities have been discovered that would allow someone uh, not only to take control of the TVs, but in many cases they're running an outdated Android uh, operating software and, and it's not updated. And so there, there's no patch that's going to these TVs. And, and uh, so there are vulnerabilities that exist that then would allow uh, people with malevolent intent to go inside the home through the TV, connect to tablets, connect to phones, download passwords, download usernames, download personal information. Uh, the additional problem is this, this uh, Samsung Smart TV has uh, voice recognition capability. Uh, and it turns out that even if you disable the voice recognition capability, it still automatically listens in on your conversations and sends it to a third party uh, vendor. If I could, uh, I'll slap to that a bit. Yeah. Um, one issue concerning things which, Internet of Things, which come out um, in rapid fire from manufacturers is that they want to get to market quickly. And so it, the engineering design comes out with a huge amount of functionality. And every time you add functionality, it's more code, it's more technology, and very often the rush to get to market leaves security behind from entertainment and consumer product vendors, which is why these um, devices and appliances come out to market with, with the vulnerabilities. And in some cases, the ecosystem, and we'll talk about that uh, shortly, the ecosystem around a device, uh, for example, the Android. The Android operating system ecosystem is not quite as secure, for example, as um, one might uh, think about Apple in terms of control over applications. And so the ecosystem controlling uh, the security around the device, its support, enables these devices to go out in the, into the environment, and you increase your target surface. And they're on the network along with your home computer, which you may run Quicken on. It's on the same network now that maybe your home security system might be connected to. It might be on the same system that eventually you'll be able to remote control the heating system or the security system. And it's a trusted device, and so it becomes a method for getting into your home system, maybe getting into your financial uh, management applications, maybe controlling your home, turning off security systems. Right. So the, in terms of the uh, voice recognition software, uh, 
uh, the California legislature actually passed a uh, law that went into effect on January 1st that doesn't prohibit the use of the voice recognition software, but does prohibit uh, whatever is captured from being sold to third parties, which doesn't completely uh, eliminate the problem. But, you know, it isn't just that there is a little machine whirring away in the back of the smart TV that does wondrous things. Uh, that communication is going somewhere else, and depending upon how secure that third party's uh, servers are, uh, you know, whatever conversation you may be having in the the, uh, the room with the TV uh, could be compromised. So if you're having, uh, well, well, if you're having a, a discussion that you wouldn't want the rest of the world to uh, to hear, you might want to uh, do it in a room that doesn't have a smart TV in it. Uh, Cars, as you know, cars are really rolling computers. Um, virtually every function in a car is controlled by a small uh, computer, uh, and that introduces vulnerabilities. As Mike said earlier, as you have more and more layers of technology, it can lead to problems. So this is a picture of one particular aspect. This is a photograph of the Uconnect infotainment interface on a Jeep Cherokee, uh, and uh, you know, system does you know a number of things. It, it, it puts up maps. You can listen to all kinds of music. You can connect your phone to it. Uh, unfortunately, that also provides an avenue for hackers to get in. You think, okay, well, maybe the hackers get in and change the channel, uh, and that is true. But because uh, these systems are in some way interconnected with the other systems in the car, uh, more can happen. So. Uh, how many here in the room are familiar with uh, uh, an experiment that was done with a couple of uh, uh, professional uh, security analysts to see what they could do with a Jeep Cherokee? All right, quite a few. Well, let, let's take a look. As they drove down the interstate, things started getting unpleasant and very loud. So they've now turned on his radio from two miles away. He's driving down I-64 in St. Louis. He can't turn it down. Now they've turned on his windshield wipers and the, uh, the, the fluid. <laughs> Do it. Kill the engine. So we're killing the engine right now. All right, so the, the, the uh, car decelerated. He had, the, the engine was off. He had no ability. Now that... Because this is a writer for Wired Magazine, uh, you can see this on their uh, website, and we've got the citation here if you want to see the whole thing, because it goes for about five minutes. Uh, you know, th this was all set up with the hackers, so he knew that he was going to get hacked. I mean, otherwise, he's not driving around with somebody videoing him every time he drives uh, <laughs> through St. Louis. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, as he writes in the article, he was uh, scared out of his mind, which is why he used some uh, sometimes uh, colorful language uh, even though he knew something was going to happen. They didn't tell him exactly what. And he really started to panic. And you can see in the video after we cut it off where he's, he you know, starts to say what's going on. And they say, look, you, you just have to stop the car and restart the engine and it will all reset, which it did. Let, let's, add a, let's expand that a bit. Um, as a manufacturer uh, or let's say you're a car manufacturer or a component manufacturer for cars, your concern might be, oh, I, I, could, I could harm, this could harm several individuals or a group of individuals 10, 20. Imagine, because it's the same set of signals, regardless of which car, imagine somebody applying this to a fleet of cars on a highway or in a municipal area as an attack on uh, an area or region. Um, the consequences would, could be a lot larger. And so now you're talking about potentially, even though you're a car manufacturer, even a national security or regional security issue. Which led, as a matter of fact, the FBI uh, to uh, issue this alert earlier this month, uh, talking about uh, the security vulnerability of cars and and uh, 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 you know bringing you know unfortunately the announcement didn't exactly say here's how to solve the problem, uh, mm -hmm. but it did say you, you know particularly if you're using uh, third party um, uh, aftermarket products on your car. Uh, alerting auto manufacturers they really need to uh, take a look and, and uh, consumers uh, to pay attention uh, to what's going on. Um, 
you know, the, the list goes on, and, and I'm sure you didn't uh, come today uh, both for the uh, lunch and to, or only for the lunch, and to hear us just talk about the problems. You, you want solutions, and we're going to talk about that, and uh, that, that's where Mike's expertise uh, comes in particularly handy. Uh, but there have been a number of other uh, instances, and, the, and these are, are not in the industrial sector. Mike's going to talk in a moment about uh, the attacks that have actually occurred, have been either thwarted by the intelligence community or have uh, created damage, but in things that you might find in your home. One thing I didn't put on here is the uh, TrendNet uh, camera, which uh, is a camera that was used for uh, baby monitoring or the so-called nanny cam. People would have it in their house. It turned out that uh, uh, it w had all kinds of vulnerabilities that would allow somebody outside the home to take control and download and, and stream the images. Uh, you know, now for. For some people, that was just a, you know, whatever strange thrill they got from watching people put their baby to sleep. But, uh, you, you know, beyond that, it obviously creates problems. If you know when somebody is home or when they're not, uh, you might as well put a sign in front of your house that says, you know, prime burglar hours. Uh, and, and so the uh, uh, Federal Trade Commission actually brought an action against TrendNet and, and got them to uh, pull the product and, and re-engineer it. Nest thermostats. Now, you know, this is one of the most high-tech devices. Google bought uh, Nest recently, um, and a couple of things have emerged. I mean, one, uh, in December of last year, it, it turned out that when Nest downloaded supposedly a software upgrade, it had the opposite effect, and it turned off most of the devices in December which is a problem. So a lot of people woke up and found that their homes were cold. And, and the problem at that point kind of ended there, but the same vulnerability and the same you know, ability to direct the device could, could uh, be put to more nefarious uh, uses. Security researchers uh, a couple years ago, uh, or maybe it was, I guess it was in the middle of last year, uh, released a report that said that Nest devices were vulnerable if someone had physical access to them for 15 seconds. So this can't so far, they haven't figured out a way to, to jailbreak them uh, remotely. But if someone had access to them for 15 seconds, they could put a USB port in, download software that would then allow the Nest thermostat to take control of every other uh, uh, device, refrigerator, TV, uh, personal computer, whatever else was connected to the Wi-Fi uh, within the home. Um, and, you know, so the two problems, you say, well, don't let anyone in your house. But you, you think of, you know, you have somebody coming in to do uh, a repair person or people who buy secondhand products on eBay or Craigslist, don't buy a thermostat that isn't new, okay? <laughs> because it, it could uh, cause a lot of problems. And then, of course, everybody's favorite, the Hello Barbie talking doll. Uh, I'm not really familiar with the product, but apparently there's an, inter uh, an Internet-connected version uh, that allows children to uh, talk and have Barbie talk back, and it goes to some kind of a, a server. Uh, and it, it turns out that this was uh, easily hackable, and, and uh, uh, with very little effort, somebody could download and, and uh, listen to uh, children's voices. So what has been happening on kind of the legal and regulatory front? Um, the Federal Trade Commission has really jumped on uh, cybersecurity um, in a number of areas. The, as, as you can see here, the uh, Federal Trade Commission Act prohibits unfair and deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce, which doesn't, of course, directly uh, address cybersecurity. But uh, uh, beginning in 2005, the FTC really began jumping on uh, cybersecurity lapses, particularly for products that were labeled as encrypted or secure or whatever and weren't. So we talked about uh, the TrendNet devices, um, mobile devices from HTC, uh, routers, uh, have all been subject to actions as well as a number of others. Uh, and uh, last year, the Third Circuit, uh, in uh, an important decision w in, in which Wyndham Hotels said, well, wait a minute, you're, you're coming after us for inadequate security, uh, but we don't read the act as saying anything about cybersecurity, and we didn't have fair notice uh, that the FTC could regulate this, and the Third Circuit said, think again. <laughs> uh, then there are, of course... Uh, plaintiff's lawyers, uh, and all it takes is one reported uh, security breach, and uh, they come out in droves. Uh, this is just a copy of, of uh, one of the class action complaints arising out of the Jeep Cherokee hack, uh, suing both Chrysler and uh, Herman International, which manufactured 
uh, the actual UConnect system. Um, and, and we'll talk in a minute, a lot of these uh, cases haven't gone very far because the uh, consumers couldn't show actual injury, but it doesn't take much to uh, attract the plaintiff's bar. So what, what has been happening in the courts uh, in connection with these cases? Primarily, they, the, the cases that, that have been brought so far, and I'm, just to be clear, here we're not talking about uh, actions by regulatory agencies against banks, against institutions, uh, for uh, lack security that could lead to a data breach or something of that nature. Right here for the moment, I'm talking more about products that, that uh, are sold to uh, consumers, including cars. Um, one, the complaints usually say you have a defective design. You didn't, you, you didn't anticipate the possibility of cyber vulnerabilities when you designed it, something that Mike's going to talk about. <clears throat> How do you, in your design process, if you're a manufacturer, think about these things in advance and design a product that, that isn't going to have these vulnerabilities, or at least how do you minimize the, the vulnerabilities that will exist? Uh, second is a failure to notify your customers. In a, many, in a number of cases, the vulnerabilities were identified by hackers or others who communicated with the company, uh, which verified that there was a vulnerability in the company for whatever reason didn't report that to its consumers. You, you could see the problem you have if you're uh, in the general counsel's office at, at a company that sells these products, you say, well, wait a minute, you know, do I really want to go out to everybody before we have some kind of patch in place or whatever and tell them uh, that they're at risk? Uh, you know, the problem is if you don't, in retrospect, people are going to come and say, well, wait a minute, I, you know, people were watching me or potentially watching me or whatever the case is, or I could have been killed in the car with the infusion pump and you didn't let me know. And then there are cases involving um, failures to remedy, and, and uh, this is more... Uh, again, something that I believe Mike's going to talk about in a little bit. How do you design your product so that the, if there is a problem, you come up with an efficient way to deliver a solution? Um, in the case of the Uconnect system in the Jeep Cherokee, uh, part of the problem was that there was no way directly to correct the software problem. People either had to go into a service center or have mailed to them uh, a thumb drive in which they could uh, uh, import a software uh, upgrade. By contrast, when a cyber vulnerability was discovered uh, in the Tesla Model S, <coughs> Tesla downloaded the patch wirelessly almost immediately. Now that, as I'm sure Mike will talk about, the ability to download stuff also creates a, a, a potential path. Um, and I'm going to let Mike talk about all the technical stuff. Uh, and then um, a number of the cases also talk about uh, breaches of implied warranties, uh, of merchantability or fitness. Um, we're not going to talk here about invasion of privacy, but my partner, Jamie Nafziger, who's right over here, wave, Jamie, uh, has uh, spoken and written extensively about this, and, and uh, if that's of interest, uh, I, I commend uh, Jamie's work to you. Um, uh, fraud cases in which it's claimed that, that cyber vulnerabilities were not shared with the public, and then you get into the question of damages, and in just a moment I'll, I'll tell you how this works. Obviously, if some cyber vulnerability leads to your plant ble being blown up or you have to get rid of all your infusion pumps, you probably have pretty direct damages. Uh, loss of sales probably gets into more consequentials. And the big ticket right now, because this is an area of law that is not well developed, I mean, we are at the very early stages of this, is loss of value. What do I mean by that? Um, a lot of the claims that have been brought, particularly against car manufacturers, say, I saw something on TV or I read it in the newspaper that my car can get hacked. I'm fearful that I'm uh, going to be run off the road or someone's going to take control of the steering. Um, and, and if the question is, okay, well, how are you harmed? The courts have said, you know, just reading this, if no one's actually been hacked, this is just demonstration, you don't have a remedy. On the other hand, the courts have said prospectively, if you can demonstrate that the value of the car or the resale value of your equipment is diminished, then you do uh, potentially have a claim. If I could add a little more. Of course. People don't want to hear me anymore. They want to hear Sorry. you. Um, often because of working with clients on cybersecurity issues, we talk about risk and impact to the firm itself. These are, in fact, damages and impacts to those who are consumers or users of a, a company service or product. But we also need to take into account the impact on the firm itself. Um, reputation damage, having regulators now um, 
you know, sending a, a team of 50 individuals to your site and you spending the next three years, hundreds of uh, maybe in tens or, or hundreds of millions of dollars even to respond to regulators. Uh, in addition to that, uh, requirements for spending millions on updating our cybersecurity program, not to mention, of course, people won't buy your products. Um, I don't buy certain cars because I don't think they're reliable after reading about their history and their reliability over the last several years or decade. And so the, there's also, of course, the, the damage to, the, to your own uh, firm itself uh, in the area of financial sales, uh, reputation, regulatory as well. Absolutely. Uh, so here, without spending too much more time, these are some cases you might want to keep in mind or keep this uh, uh, slide in your desk drawer in, in case uh, someone decides to sue you. But uh, uh, these cases all talk about the need to show injury in fact. And so far, a lot of the cases involving uh, Internet of Things vulnerabilities have foundered on the fact that, that the plaintiffs could not establish a real injury. But uh, particularly in the, the Toyota case that I mentioned there, from last November, the, the judge made clear that it would be a different case if uh, the plaintiffs could show that the, the blue book value of their car went down uh, because of the vulnerability. So what are some of the legal questions uh, yet to be answered? And then I promise we're going to turn from the problem guy to the solution guy. Um, uh, one is uh, the interplay between tort law and the law governing licenses, because when you're, you're dealing with a rolling computer or equipment that is largely software, much of this is covered by uh, software that, that has some kind of uh, click wrap license that you may not even have been aware of uh, that, that purports to uh, limit your remedies. So, for instance, in the Uconnect system, now this isn't uh, Harman, the hardware manufacturer, but this is Sprint, which actually provides a service. Uh, this is just the, the first of many pages, if you were to actually print it out, of their terms of service. And you can see that they say, well, any dispute is going to go to mandatory arbitration. You waive your jury rights. Uh, you don't get to bring a class action. Uh, and then there, elsewhere there, of course, is a uh, waiver uh, uh, of any consequential damages, et cetera. And there's an interesting question when you get into a product that, that causes a problem, either uh, physical harm or um, you know, to your person as opposed to property, uh, you know, what is the interplay? Probably in a personal injury case, no one's going to pay a lot of attention to the software licenses. If it's a purely economic damage, it may be a different story. And again, this is something to keep an eye on. It hasn't been uh, uh, fully determined. Uh, the other issue is insurance coverage. Uh, you know, as many of you know, there are companies out there that write specific cyber coverage, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to be covered for cyber vulnerabilities, particularly if you're not going to follow Mike's advice and be first in class. Uh, as an example, the Cottage uh, Health System, which is a small hospital group in Southern California, uh, had a data breach and, and paid out, I think it was $4.1 million. It turned to its insurer, which was an, a, an AIG affiliate. Uh, and AIG turned around and brought a declaratory judgment action saying we don't have to uh, cover you because of an exclusion in their policy, uh, which apparently is fairly common in cyber policies that excluded coverage for, quote, failure to follow minimum required practices. So, you know, you think you've got cyber coverage, and then post facto, your insurer says, well, nice try, but we're not covering you because, uh, you, you know, you, you didn't follow minimum required practices. Now, there's no definition of a minimum required practice, so that's where lawyers get to come in and fight about it, I presume. Um, from experience in filling out the cybersecurity portion of various uh, corporate liability insurance uh, renewals and applications, um, I can attest, that's probably not the right word I should use in a, with a lawyer, but I can attest. Not to worry. I can attest to the fact that the questions that are asked are pretty simple, pretty primitive. Do you have a policy? Do you have an organization? Um, it doesn't um, force the, the individual responding to actually do any sort of assessment on the capabilities of the organization. Uh, for example, you might, uh, is your organization compliant with a national standard for cybersecurity management? Um, there is an ISO standard uh, 27000 uh, and, and, and a series of um, related um, uh, standards that go with that is also a U.S. NIST set of standards for cybersecurity. Or, you know, another recommendation might be to prepare yourself for the event that one day 
you do have to have the insurance company cover you and you want to ensure your program is appropriate, is to have an assessment done. Um, not just necessarily against a set of standards, but against best practices by a, a good uh, organization that can actually uh, determine if your program is organized right, if it's run right, if it's integrated into the design and operation areas in an adequate way to protect when you manufacture uh, products as well as deliver services for them. And so um, that's an area that, just to highlight, uh, you, you be concerned with the simplicity and ease of answering these versus how much of a drill, of a, a dentist drilling you'll get if something occurs to examine your or your cybersecurity program. So uh, terrific segue, Mike, well <laughs> set up. Uh, we're now gonna turn to you know, what you need to be doing or what your companies need to be doing uh, you know, to develop a culture uh, that, that emphasizes uh, cybersecurity, that uh, uh, assesses vulnerabilities, that, that follows best practices that will make sure that this exclusion doesn't apply. Mike, I'll turn it over to you. If you look at, um, if we talk about what a cybersecurity organization or a function, whether it's at a, a product design organization, an integrator, or a manufacturer, or any organization, you want to ensure that for all information assets, products with information assets in them, three basic services are always designed in as appropriate. You'll hear the term CIA, and it's not the intelligence agency, to ensure that um, whether it's a product or a system, that there's adequate confidentiality of the data going through the system, uh, and so that those who don't or shouldn't have unauthorized access uh, cannot access that. You, second uh, service that you provide is the integrity so that a command being sent, for example, to uh, spin up uh, or to adjust the temperature in a blast furnace um, is an, a, a shutdown, an abrupt shutdown that destroys it. Um, so the integrity of the data, integrity of the commands, the, any information and command and control traffic communication that is being sent either in a product, in a system, uh, or in a banking transaction. Um, you also want to ensure availability, that, that the service is not disrupted, the availability of the product or service. And so you strive to ensure that those three basic services, key functions are applied, whether it's a product, whether it's the enterprise around the product design, and we're going to go a bit more into that. And so you want to ensure in an IoT system or a product, is the information safe? Um, data gets aggregated um, out of these uh, front-end systems that are connected to you or to your hospital uh, room. Uh, is, a, is the data safe from unauthorized access? Um, is it, are the systems secure from being misused in a way that could harm somebody or disrupt something? And um, you also want to ensure that operational disruptions can occur. Uh, and then um, you want to, the other thing we talked about, and it picks up on a thread of conversation we've already addressed, is that when you create a product that talks to other products, you want to ensure that you do not introduce a vulnerable access. You do not introduce a vulnerability into the system. Like the poorly designed um, Android smartphone that's not protected, and it's now talking to every other device including my home computer, which has financial management on it. It's important um, to talk about some overarching cybersecurity concepts before I get into a discussion about what are some key issues for or concerns for those who design and integrate and those in manufacturing, as well as um, those who operate and deliver services. Um, it's important to, to look at the cybersecurity requirements both at a component level, but also where it fits into the ecosystem. And we'll have an example of that later. But the ecosystem is not merely, it doesn't stop, for example, in the car. Um, you know, we, the car has a Uconnect bus, and across that bus, multiple devices all talk. Um, and so, so you want to ensure that you do not introduce the vulnerability onto that communication path that affects the cruise control. Um, and uh, so it's important to think end-to-end, -end, but also not just within an integrated system, but the total ecosystem, suppliers, support mechanisms. Um, uh, I've experienced um, when I started out with a major global manufacturer uh, a, a decade ago, um, the, uh, uh, the security staff reported to me that they don't worry that we had connected securely to our, our vendors and our suppliers. And as I asked the question, did you check them out at the other end? Did they have an adequate cybersecurity program um, during a headlights look? A few weeks later, uh, globally, the factories were shut down because the, one of the uh, servicers of um, ICS, or industrial control systems, in our, um, and the networks in factories, 
um, was not well secured. And through them, an attack of, uh, of viruses came into our environment and shut down the global enterprise and even access of sending data up to, uh, the, to financial management. Uh, and so the entire ecosystem is important, and we're going to address a little more of that in a moment. One thing that's important is to assume that you have multiple sophisticated adversaries. You may not think that your product may be of interest, uh, but um, I have witnessed examples where uh, when um, dissenters from a, a well-known Asian country were visiting um, some uh, a journalist here in the United States, that the uh, foreign state actually... Um, uh, exploited or actually attacked and intruded into video and um, monitoring systems in the facility where they were visiting. Um, and if you think it's a lot easier to uh, monitor somebody and harm them electronically and remotely just be and knowing where they are uh, as opposed to trying to deliver a plutonium pellet, um, it, it, it can occur. And in uh, one, one comment I used at a, at a couple of different NSA-sponsored events Cyber attack weaponry and methodology is probably the most easily disseminated kind of weaponry and attack. You can buy these on, you know, you can buy malware and attack methodology on dark markets. And, and so um, for organized crime, especially where they can buy experts, uh, the ability to buy enough crimeware to, uh, and, a, and attack a hospital uh, to hold them for ransom is, is not far-fetched. And uh, a couple of examples of, um, of what's happened at an industrial level a year ago, the, um, a, a German agency responsible for um, one of the homeland, their homeland security um, departments uh, listed a number of in events that had happened in 2014, including uh, a cyber attack by, um, they didn't disclose it was organized crime or a foreign state, but the destruction of the main blast furnace at a steel mill um, in, in that the uh, attacker had identified the operational sequencing in the enterprise and disrupted the blast furnace by shutting it down in an abnormal shutdown mode and destroyed it. And we're talking about maybe $100 million. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ukrainian incident. I promise to give a little more details. But um, what's happening is that, the, uh, that those who are attacking are buying the expertise of engineers. My first degree is engineering. I know there's a lot of engineers out there, product designers, as well as hackers. You combine that, and now you can deliver an attack that's, you know, that exploits and compromises a product. In the Ukrainian attack, just to give you an example of the sophistication, um, at, at the point of attack, what occurred is the operators are looking at their screen in a huge control center, and all of a sudden they lost control of the screen. And 70 different substations, these large facilities around the region, um, were accessed from a control screen, and all of the switches, and we're talking about switches with many thousands of volts, we just started clicking right off. Um, in order to know that, then the adversary must have been in the networks monitoring, first doing research, and then monitoring the operational processes and how that system functioned and what control software was used. And they were able to get that once they, and they got access to the network. They learned that. They turned off access by the operators. Um, then they shut down the, um, the substations. Uh, they also turned off the power at the control center. They turned off the backup power, and then they destroyed the software on the on the industrial control systems, the Internet of Things. They actually, uh, the firmware can be erased and changed, which is another reason you need to be careful about how you can put patches into systems. The patching and update mechanisms on these systems were not secured, and the attacker, knowing how operation was done, destroyed the firmware on it, so then the control center, even when the lights went back on, they couldn't remotely turn on the breakers. They had to send individuals out. And to, make, to, to, to improve on it further, they also destroyed the firmware and software at the communication link out of each of the substations. And that's the type of adversary you'll face. Some of you may not be within industrial uh, control, but once a knowledge about how a, a, smart screen, a, a smart TV works or something else, that gets disseminated, and those methodologies don't have to be recreated by someone uh, with a lot of operational smarts. But, but the money is there. It's, as uh, Willie Sutton once said, why? It's because the money is there. Um, so to move on, it's important to integrate security into your design and integration operations, not merely as some thoughts where you tell engineers to, uh, to add it, but to build teams that, are, um, that actually apply security during the design. 
Another concept to understand is that um, reliability, engineering reliability, is not equal to being uh, cyber secure. And as an example, I've seen evidence of, of where engineers have designed power systems, and, in, uh, and they, it, smart meters, for example. Um, I asked, for example, if you were to send out a sequence to all of the smart meters in a region, Maryland, for example, has two million smart meters, and you shut them all off and on at the same time, the power surge might blow out parts of the distribution um, uh, 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 channels throughout the entire region. Well, we have software, we have a software module that sequences and makes sure that the commands cannot be sent out all at once. And I said, what do you think the very first thing that the attacker will compromise, it's your reliability software, your safety mechanisms. And so engineers don't necessarily think in terms of reliability. The other thing is compliance doesn't equal security. You know that, for example, Target was compliant with the uh, data standards for securing transactions. They are typically a minimal set of requirements, and it's important that you maintain a cybersecurity organization that analyze risks, make sure that when designing is done, it's integrated into the design process, and also that you protect the enterprise around engineering and around operations so that even if the engineers are thinking about it, the, what they, the results, what they produce, so the designs and so on aren't compromised without even them knowing it. Um, can we go on? So if we're talking about considerations for design and integration, um, again, we're going to talk about some things to design in and how you design, but I want to reemphasize it's also about process and building the right resources in the team and the program around it, because even if you design a secure product, um, as an example, uh, manufacturers of IoT, Internet of Things controllers, uh, industrial control systems that control everything from foundries to um, pumps at a hospital uh, to the utilities, they themselves have actually been attacked. And after the design was done, attackers have injected code because the company itself didn't protect the environment in which this was the, the products are being designed. And we're going to talk about that, what, be, what needs to be designed in the product, but also how do you also need to make sure that the environment in which products are designed and operated is also secure. And so it, there needs to be a necessity for um, integrating into your design processes, whether it's the firmware, whether it's the hardware, and whether it's the interfaces between components, like the entertainment module and the navigation system on a, on a bus in a car, that each of these areas, um, you've built in cybersecurity expertise, thinking about, as you note on the next bullet, threat modeling. Who would attack it? How? What are the vulnerabilities in the components? What are the vulnerabilities in the system? and helping engineers understand how to design support to that. So integrated security and design teams include threat modeling to design to set security requirements for the design. Assume each system component can be compromised. Um, it's called layering your defense. On the one hand, you want to ensure that everything in your system authenticates to each other. If um, you don't want, uh, for example, the, um, the, uh, uh, the system for controlling the cruise control, you want to make sure that whatever's talking to engine control module is the internal cruise control module, and so they talk and authenticate to each other automatically, program to program. You want to make sure it's not a piece of malware that's been injected in the system and it's talking and, and, and forging uh, the relationship from the cruise control to the engine control to make it go faster, shut down. So assume that components in your systems, each one of which may be compromised, and, it's, and also create resilience around each module when it receives instructions that it does, it's actually designed in that you check the information and instructions it received. So each component on its own can not only uh, validate its interaction with others, but also can uh, provide alarming and alerting, automatic ar alarming and alerting that can be rolled up to some sort of uh, system that logs those results. Um, you also to ensure that you apply concepts of encryption so that when those commands and authentication between modules occur, encryption is not only keeps things confidential, encryption also ensures that the commands themselves have integrity. You have to have encryption keys to open up a command link, and if you, don't, if you are encrypted, then you can't uh, insert your own instruction to compromise the system. So you want to ensure there's integrity of command and control and the data that's flowing across links or between system and components with encryption. You also want to ensure that your data at rest, your data in transit in the systems, or being sent to back-end systems where big data uh, farms are, are assembling 
um, inform private information about individuals, maybe off of a hospital database, ensure uh, apply encryption for at rest or when it's being transited for sensitive data. Um, you also, as I mentioned, want to build in the, the ability to alert from the module level as well as the system level. And so you have the ability to start rolling up. This isn't this uh, an execute. Something happened that wasn't normal, abnormal. And I'm going to alert the system, the individual on the screen or in an operational, perhaps sending the signal back to a, a service monitoring, a, a monitoring service for uh, a heart monitor. Something abnormal happened. This could be operational, but it could also be uh, a security issue. Moreover, you want to have pen testing done. You may have heard the, the, uh, the term penetration testing, but you also need to do it on modules. And one example I can give you is um, I've been responsible for a couple of regional smart meter installations. Um, one of the things we wanted to validate is from the vendor of the smart meter, have you done a pen test and a thorough analysis of vulnerabilities on your smart meter? When we drilled down, the, the most recent smart uh, penetration test was about four years old. And the vulnerabilities found had not all been remediated. And by then, the system has actually been, had gone through several revisions, uh, probably more vulnerabilities introduced. And so you want to ensure you have an up-to-date pen test and assessment of your products and your system to ensure that you've caught the vulnerabilities that may have gotten their way through the design cycle, or perhaps because vulnerabilities are discovered every day, they weren't understood or known at the time of design. And so pen testing on a regular basis, especially with new releases, is critical. Uh, in terms of manufacturing, one of the things that's critical is managing your supply chain. Often I'm in working with various companies, one of the issues I see where there's a, a gap, and if you recall, I think one example might be with Target, service providers, vendors, suppliers, um, there needs to be a rigorous program that identifies from the beginning of a procurement cycle through production and offboarding that you identify selection criteria, you validate that, you know, and these include like they have an adequate cybersecurity program. If they design things for you, they have an adequate secure design process, that their entire process for managing security for the product or component they provide you, as well as the environment in which they do that is secure. And it, and it goes on in terms of procurement cycle to ensure that that goes in contracts, statements of work, that you include in there the ability to oversee and validate during production and during your relationship with the firm, that they adhere to those obligations, and that you even have a method for offboarding them and ensuring that is done in a secure way. And that can be with vendors and suppliers of components, um, of services, uh, anything that connects your enterprise or provides you something that goes into your product. This also applies to your business partners, not just your suppliers and vendors. Um, your bank, for example, and with, to which you do financial transactions. You also should ensure, as a manufacturer and a supplier, that at key points along the production chain, you apply testing and sampling of the product to make sure they've not been compromised. You could, for example, send out a design for a new chip or a component to a manufacturer in the Far East, and when it comes back, for all you know, the design files themselves may have been modified and malware injected into that, and the components are coming back to you from that manufacturer now with malware uh, and a command and control. And I think we will wrap up, uh, at least my part on this, um, on uh, the discussion of the entire enterprise program. As I mentioned, it's important not just to, to think about designing uh, the product with security, but whether you're a designer, an integrator, a manufacturer, or a provider of service, you need to think holistically of delivering an entire program. And this includes looking, and these services or functional areas are critical whether you're looking at your enterprise, the enterprise in which you're designing a product, supporting a product, as well as the product itself. And as an example, establishing the formal function for patching, a vulnerability management of patching. So within your enterprise, you want to make sure that the systems on which engineers design products is secure and it's updated and it's tracked for new vulnerabilities and immediately or in a reasonable time patched. You also want to have a process where you can apply these these processes themselves, patching, for example, to the products themselves in a secure and automated fashion. Um, and I gave the example before about the, the SCADA system. So th it's important to have a cybersecurity program deliver these key functions and also look at the identified other functions in the company that the cybersecurity program needs to work with. If we're talking about supply chain management, then you need to have a supply chain process which ties back to the cybersecurity individuals for the procurement. If we're talking about risk management uh, over partners, you want to ensure that the company's risk organization interacts with the cybersecurity organization. 
You want to ensure, for example, that uh, an example I can provide you is once I found vulnerabilities on a design station engineers used because it was an outdated obsolete design station with Windows 98 in it, and it wasn't that long ago, and it couldn't be maintained for secure. So maintaining the technology itself up to date so that it can be patched. So it's important to look at your program and ensure that there's a program itself, a series of functions, an organization to support it, the right resources, the right maturity, both for inward facing into your enterprise as well as applying this to the product delivery itself. All right, and, and you have a case study in the materials for everyone, and I don't know if you want to give a two-minute thumbnail of that or, sure. or not. Let's just touch on uh, the first one, the connected vehicle ecosystem. Right. Just to highlight the fact, um, this is a case study. We'll just touch on it briefly. It's included in, in the uh, material. Again, identify the entire ecosystem and the vehicle itself. And in the future, that ecosystem will be the highway. It'll be automated, uh, traffic control, toll control. It'll be the support mechanisms at the, uh, uh, at the uh, dealer for service. And so you need to think through the entire system, especially if you're Ford or GM, uh, in, in terms of identifying ways to secure throughout and, and whichever use case, however the car is used or accessed or supported. Let's go to the next one. And as we talked before, if you look at the, that uh, system and all the components that go into it, this is a bit of a breakdown. It tells you, this kind of identifies what are all the different things that can be affected because they're interconnected in the, in the car. Transmission, brakes, safety mechanisms, entertainment mechanisms, as w and again, the rest of the ecosystem. Let's go to uh, slide uh, 31. Which is uh, 31. There we go. One more. Um, I'm only going to touch upon this. We talked about a vulnerability or threat assessment. It's important to start ident to think about identifying the vulnerabilities that can occur, and then how do you address them with security in the design and in operations. You can read that more at your leisure. Right. And, and then lastly, if we talk about an entire security program, let's go to slide 35. Start with that one. Start thinking about constructing a cybersecurity program across the ecosystem, or at least you're part of it, um, and to conceptualize how you fit in the ecosystem if you're a supplier, a servicer, or the manufacturer itself. Great. It, I hope that we've been able to give you at least an overview in the hour that we've been together of some of the issues that are arising. Uh, as you can see, you know, the Internet of Things uh, – provides a lot of opportunities in, in commerce, a lot of great technologies, uh, but it also creates some real vulnerabilities. And the law is, is kind of behind the curve on this. But uh, uh, as Mike uh, referenced, I mean, this, this involves how you draft your contracts with your suppliers as well as uh, what you're actually doing to oversee it. Uh, licensing is, is uh, obviously uh, an issue. You need to know what, what's uh, going on from that standpoint. And uh, you really do need to be up on this and be best of class from a liability standpoint, uh, not only because of the damage to your business, your reputation, uh, but also uh, uh, the legal consequences uh, in, a, in a lawsuit. So we're right at the top of the hour. Uh, Mike and I will stick around. If uh, uh, people in the audience here have questions, we're happy to answer them. If you're uh, online, uh, you can... Uh, send a message to DorseyU at Dorsey.com, and we'll get those messages and, and get back to you and try to answer those as well. Thank you, everyone, for attending.